I have the pleasure now to introduce one of my favorite people too wow. in the Merrimack Valley. Well, I said the Merrimack Valley because I don't want anybody else to do that. But um, seriously, David David Sowers uh, is um, a person that I met some more oh, 20 years ago uh, practicing. I was I joined the Tai Chi class, and here is this guy. Um, doing Tai Chi, but also putting needles in people's heads. Um, and he's come wow. to the agency many times and just put needles in my head. I don't know what they are. I didn't ask for them, but um, anyway. <laughs> Seriously, he, uh, he's been, he, he is the uh, founder of First Health in Andover. He's written, written a lot of books, but I love the title of them. The Complete Idiot's Guide, Acupuncture and Acupressure. Hey! <laughs> Um, and several others. They're all listed here. Um, he is an amazing person. You'll see his positive energy just bounces off of you. So, without any further ado, David, take it away. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. You're wonderful. Well, good morning. It, it's great to be here. You're just walking through a stage. It's the stage of your life. It's okay. <laughs> So I want to thank everybody first for coming, you know, Massachusetts Association of Older Americans, thank you so much, uh, Massachusetts Department of Mental Health, Elder Service of the Merrimack Valley, who I've grown to appreciate and love many times, and also Hebrew Senior Life. There's a couple events that happened early in my life that have shaped my entire life. Uh, all of them have to do with this subject matter today. Uh, the first thing is that when I was younger, my father was telling me a story about having a paper out for five years. Later did I realize that I would also have a paper out for five years. That's kind of what he was saying to me. <laughs> On that paper out, which covered School Street, First Street, and Central Street, and Liberty Street, and I remember those streets very well, uh, were mostly older Americans. So my paper out as a kid, eight, nine, ten years old, was really filled with examples of people telling me stories. They could not wait to tell me their story. I was very impressionable then and now. I love to hear stories. I love to hear stories of people's lives. I love to hear turning points. I love to hear empowerment points. I love to hear times when there were overwhelming obstacles and what were those solutions or not. I, I like to hear world events that I've read about from somebody who was there. I loved it. Hence, if you were on my paper out, you got your after-school paper like at 7.30 at night. <laughs> so, no one liked me as a paper boy. You know? so, I was very late. The second thing that happened is I was fortunate enough to grow up with uh, both sets of my grandparents, and I know that that's unusual. So I'm from London, Ohio. I'm a Buckeye. Any other Buckeyes in there? I, yeah, go, go Bucks. And I heard Kentucky. We have lots of jokes that I know from the Ohio side, which I will not tell now. S growing up with both sets of my grandparents had a tremendous influence on me because one, both sides of my family are ministers. So I actually understood a lot about people, faith, doing something that j you can't touch understanding that somebody's passion and how they live their life is not necessarily for some of the things that we can touch but really understanding the importance of that in people's lives and understanding the power of that in people's lives uh, the, so my grandpa Bennett they were also missionaries so they traveled around the world everyone loved them I never saw them through for 20 some years because they were traveling all around the world as missionaries but we would get letters from them, and then we would go to church, and we'd hear people talk about them. And then my great-grandpa, uh, Sollers, was the uh, preacher in our uh, church. And we got to see from both sides of the family, you know, power of presence, power of belief. Pow power. I mean, in a positive way. People who cared about the community, outreach, became a central part of the community. Communication, love, family, bringing together. These were things that strengthened our family. These are things that strengthened our community. But also, these were all done by older Americans. They were all done by people who were much older than I was. I thought they were ancient until I turned 50 and realized, maybe not so ancient. <laughs> But at the same time, these were role models that I had, and I was lucky enough to have them, and they added value to my life. They, they have shaped my life even until this moment. They continue to add value to my life. They continue to be the things that shape me. So, <laughs> what happened is that I decided that I would give back. And so part of my world has been to try to help in nonprofits, to try to be chairman, to try to stand up. They put me in the pulpit at eight years old to give the Easter 
sermon. <laughs> so I just didn't have any choice, you know. I was in the Winnie the Pooh at five, so I just had to like get up there and deliver and do things. If you're given an ability to stand in front of people because you're passionate enough about your topic, then you have a responsibility to serve. And so that has been part of my role. My early career was as a theater major, so I was an actor growing up. You can imagine the look of <laughs> on, on my religious family's face. <laughs> then, of course, I just really astounded them and, and made them proud of me by becoming a martial arts expert and a fight choreographer, and uh, that made them very proud of me. And then, of course, you know, because they thought I had such promise and was probably going to be a doctor or lawyer, I made them proud of me once again by studying acupuncture and herbal medicine back in the early 80s. So once again, uh, I got a lot of <laughs> just waste, wasted life. Just had such promise, <laughs> such potential. <laughs> so 30 years later, after helping a lot of people, we find out that acupuncture, herbal medicine, Chinese Qigong, all these sort of far out and crazy things are part of a culture that has a lot to teach us. So while I spent 15 years literally trying to be Chinese, and I'm talking about dressing, eating, hanging out, learning languages, learning to writing, I realized, yes, I am just a guy from Ohio who uses this stuff. <laughs> you can use it too. It doesn't have to be us. I'm not a master of anything, although I've been privileged enough to study with some tremendously talented masters. But I use it all the time, and I've helped people really for over 30 years with these techniques. They're designed to be easily understood. They're designed to be used by you as well as anybody else. They are time-tested, and as we'll see today, there's some research that's coming up about the efficacy. And just like pretty much everything I do in my life, we're on the doorstep of understanding how to integrate a lot of these understandings and tools. One, because they have generally really been recognized as safe. So that puts us in a category of, of reasonability. Lots of people can use them and also they have are showing efficacy. Even something that goes a hundred years has to work. Try something 5,000 years old. That might actually be enough to take a look at. <laughs> and so that's what we're doing now. We're taking a look at a lot of these things. So we are going to go through uh, some experiences today and my goal here is to help you experience three things. One, we're going to look at Qigong, we're going to look at Tai Chi, we're going to look at acupressure. Anybody ever used those things before? How many in the room have used those things? So, thank you. I'm going to count on you to actually be, uh, you know, vocal about things. But I bet 10 years ago there would be almost nobody, and probably 15 years ago there would be less than that. And probably when I started about 30 years ago, I'd be standing in the room alone talking about something nobody cared about or thought about. And, and now we're starting to look at this wave of influence and saying, what else can we do? How can we help folks in some other ways? So I want you to certainly get exposed to a lot of these things, understand what they mean. You can read about these therapeutic benefits. But I think more than that, I actually want you to feel some things today. You know, I want you to understand what things are from feeling. Because what happens often, and I've taken that desire to help, from individuals. I teach a lot of corporate development, leadership development. Uh, anybody familiar with John Maxwell? You know the John Maxwell, the leadership guy. It, it turns out that my grandfather and John's uh, father were ministers in the same church back in central Ohio. So I grew up, we grew up with the Maxwell family. He's one of the world famous leadership trainers of today. We come from the same church. We come from the same place. My mother grew up with John. And so we've been linked by that. And I had a leadership development role because I had to step up and be a better leader. Because I wanted to do things. I felt I needed to make a change. I felt I needed to have something happen. I needed to lead. People were looking at me for leadership. I had to develop skills. It, it was really that simple. So I found that our job as uh, speakers, trainers, coaches, whatever we decide to do, agencies, is that we create awareness. Like today, we'll create awareness. There'll be some awareness. You'll say, oh. Huh, how about that? Hmm. Huh. Hmm. Huh. <laughs> right? Exactly. Huh. Huh. And there'll be this moment. And then we'll have some skills. You're going to learn some places. You know, uh, Miss Wilson, Nancy, do you want to go? Nancy, Nancy? Nancy gave you a, a riveting explanation of what we're all here for and gave you a lot of resources to use and gave you some skills to put in place. It's up to you, though, to develop the habits. It's up to you and it's up to all of us to actually use those resources. 
We can bring awareness. We can give you new skills. The next part is you. You develop habits. Not, not, I have my own habits, good and bad. <laughs> so you have to develop your habits. And then guess what happens? Oh, the outcomes change. Amazing, amazing. How about that? So often we find that we create awareness and it's interesting, it's fascinating, and we're like, wow, good for you, good for you. And then we have some skills and we think, oh, that was great. Do you remember last year when we did that? That was great. Have you ever done anything with that? No. Yeah, but that was great. <laughs> that was wonderful. That guy was smart. He was funny. <laughs> Did you ever do anything with that? No. <laughs> so the whole point today is that these things that I'm going to show you, they're not that hard. They're not that, I can do them. They're not that hard. And they're designed not to be. They are designed not to be. You know, we've got knowing versus feeling. I'm going to show you some things you're going to know it. This is not a big deal. And in fact, one of the things that I like about it, and Nancy was talking about cultural diversity, is that I've learned to take some of these principles and put them into my culture. As it turns out, I'm not Chinese. Big surprise to me <laughs> and a great disappointment to me, let me tell you, after many years of trying so hard, so hard, I can't tell you how many chicken feet I ate hoping <laughs> for transformation that never came. So, it's actually true. <laughs> so what happened is, but we can use these things, we can use them with our, our friends, we can work with ourselves. You know, Nancy was talking about how many people are frontline caregivers, lots of people in this room. We were talking back at our table when, when you said, how's it feel when you're with a depressed patient or client, and we used the word draining. It's draining when you're with somebody who's depressed. You, you, you have a heightened sense of agitation with you or somebody with a heightened acute anxiety or panic attack disorder. I deal with those things every day. After I'm done with the luncheon today, I go back to the clinic and guess who will be there? A growing number of my patients list anxiety as their reason for coming in. A growing number. So we're talking about all Americans and older Americans, right? So we have knowing and feeling the nature of nature. You know. One of the meditative practices that we did early on was we had to understand what nature gives us because we're part of all of this. We're part of things. We're part of a greater whole. So one way to experiment with that is to really understand uh, how you do exercises, how you read, how you think, how you reflect, how you breathe around different places in nature. We're in a room, and that's one place. We go outside, that's another place. We're by an oak tree, that's another place. We're standing in front of a waterfall, that's another place. We're in front of the ocean, that's another place. We're by a still pond in a meadow. That's another place. We're listening to cell phones. That's another place. <laughs> it's another place. So how do you behave? How do you interact? What do you think like? What do you feel like? And what can you do, more importantly, in these states, I think is, is important. So these exercises and the things that I'm going to show you today are really designed to do that, to help you with that. There's a growing body of evidence that is showing us that there's something here. We don't know exactly what and we don't know exactly why, but there's a growing body of evidence that is showing us that these techniques, and I'll just throw in the word integrative, Andrew Weil's statement, integrative, meaning that everybody does the best they can for patient-centered care and we pull out the best ones and we use that. And so it's overlapping care, overlapping. So the days of either or, well, we're going to use a medication, or we're going to do injection therapy, or we're going to use, those days are over. Uh, one, the Lone Ranger's off the air. <laughs> there, is no, there is no Lone Ranger. There are no magic bullets. What people need is what people have always asked for, is five or six ways to get well, a couple ways to maintain, and a team that I can call on when I need them. There you go. How about that? There you go. See, I do this for a living. So, so what we do is we find a variety of things. And then what do you pull out of the system? You pull out when you're well, when you're stable, when you feel well, you start pulling out things that take too much time, take too much money, or have uh, unwanted side effects. So you pull those things out first. And then what you're left with, if possible, are some self-care managed techniques that you can use, a medication that you can tolerate, a, a, a sort of a culturalization that actually helps you, a variety of things that are sustainable. It's just not for trees, it's for us too. 
we can live a sustainable life of health. We can have quality of life that's sustainable. That might, that might work. It might work financially. It might work health-wise. It might work for your mental stability. It might, it might work on a lot of different levels. And so I work with patients every day. I work with corporations, companies, talk about stress. How would you like to be a company these days trying to make it in the world? Right? You all belong to one. So we're trying to find leadership, and part of our leadership has to do with our self-leadership, has to do with our personal leadership, has to do with our personal minds, our mantra, the place where we live every day. Because, l let's be honest, we would like to believe that we think our way through life. Now, come on, every car dealership in the United States knows that you emote your way through life, right? Every car salesman in America knows that you don't buy a car because you read this thing and said, why, that makes perfect sense. <laughs> you buy a car because you look at it and you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, then you, and then it doesn't matter how much it costs and, you know, you don't eat for, you know, one week out of the month and you're like in there going, yeah. <laughs> so this is who we are. This is who we are. Let's just cop to that and go with we feel. Customized cultural empowerment. There you go. Because we can take that. You know, I'm, I, I pull from lots of different places. You know, I came from the Midwest, so I have these Midwest things. A lot of people in the Northeast say, oh my gosh, you've got this. I say, I'm just from the Midwest, really. I mean, a lot of folks are like that back there. And, and they say, oh, you have such a calming voice. Central Ohio, I mean, or Ohio, if you're from there, right? So we bring things with us. We share them with others. We learn things from someplace else. We pull them in. We start to use them. We have a cultural diverse uh, society here. I see people from all kinds of different places. When I had a practice down in Chinatown, when I was in Chinatown during my apprenticeship, I saw all kinds of folks. Then when I moved to Brookline, I saw all kinds of other folks. Then I moved up here to the Merrimack Valley and there's a bunch of other folks. So we have to understand what we can bring to the table, ask permission, say what, it, what does it mean to you when I say this? Or when, uh, you know, do you have any white cranes in, in your neighborhood? Or should we talk about something else? All you have to do is ask. They know the answers. You don't have to enforce anything on them. You just have to let them know that you care about them. You're trying to bring them a tool or a technique that you think is helpful. And it's actually a great way to engage your audience when you ask them. <laughs> and then if you actually listen and respond to them, you get immediate feedback. Because who likes to be listened to? Everybody, <laughs> right? <laughs> Every one of us. <laughs> so I think it's important to just realize when we start this that we have things that we can change. We can change them. These don't have to be static. I'm going to show you some things that you should change. I'll show you some things that if it doesn't resonate with you and your audience, change it. I am not the sacred mountain. Ask anybody who knows me. So just take what I have, change it for what fits your world, and move on with your life.